Hello, everybody. If you're new to our webinar series, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Criterion Edge runs multiple informative webinars throughout the year. Today's topic is the role of regulatory affairs in the clinical and performance evaluation process, key strategies to support project success. We are proud to announce that Criterion Edge has been awarded Company of the Year among top regulatory services companies. So how can we help you? If you'd like to speak with us about your upcoming projects or regulatory writing needs, we would be happy to book an appointment with you. You can email us for a free 30-minute consultation at consult at criterionedge.com. Our presenter today is Lori Mitchell, founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing firm serving the medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety, and pharmacovigilance management and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory and medical writing solutions to many pharma and medical device companies, both large and small, she is a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is also a published author and holds a Master of Nursing from UCLA. And now I will welcome Lori to give an overview of our session today. Hi, Lori. Hello, I was muted. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, we've received a lot of questions about the topics today, the topic uh, on the on the docket today, which is about how regulatory affairs can um, help with shepherd along and support the clinical evaluation process. So you really regulatory affairs really is poised to play a critical role in supporting the current MDR and IVDR required clinical and performance evaluation report process. And that's from pre-planning all the way through implementation and writing, and then finally the on-time submission to the notified body, which is the, which is the end of the road for the submission part. And then the work starts again when the notified body will finally get back to you with their responses. So beginning with this early critical planning stage, through completion of all required written deliverables. So this presentation examines some of the key drivers of project success, such as early strategic decisions around the route of conformity, data sufficiency, equivalence considerations, uh, internal readiness of critical documentation, project planning strategies, and finally, how to identify potential roadblocks and proactively find solutions to common problems. And I wanna mention here that the content in this uh, presentation today really does apply both to the medical device and the IVD industries, but just for the ease of speaking, I will adopt the convention of using clinical evaluation report or CER, but uh, know that for my IVD colleagues out there, really our comments today apply to both. So next slide. The learning objectives today are to, again, as we've already covered, identify the critical components of the CER process. This is the evaluation process that influence project success. Describe how regulatory affairs specifically can support cross-functional stakeholders, lead critical decision to, and lead critical uh, uh, decision-making throughout the planning, preparation, and writing of the CER, and how to recognize and implement early mitigation strategies to overcome roadblocks and drive to on-time submission. So one other thing I want to mention here too, is that this, process, uh, this uh, uh, webinar today is being given by, from the point of view of those of us at Criterion Edge, and we are medical uh, and regulatory writers. We are not regulatory professionals. And we're always careful to say we're not certified regulatory affairs professionals. Do we have an opinion about the regulatory documents that we've 
written hundreds of? Absolutely, as a writer, we do. But I want to just say that from our point of view, you are the regulatory affairs professionals, you're certified, we do not carry that certification. And we always defer to your um, strategy and judgment when it comes to uh, regulatory affairs um, uh, decisions. So next slide. You know, the clinical evaluation process, and it is a process that culminates in the report about the process, it really does have these five uh, phases. Let's start at the pre-launch planning. And then when it comes, and that can go on for some months, really. And then when it's time to start writing the report, the CER or PER, start with a scoping and a kickoff. Uh, report writing, the review and sign off, and ultimately the submission. So we're going to talk today about kind of following uh, each one of these steps. And you'll see on some of my slides, there's a like a tip at the end, at the bottom. And much of our tips are about time. And this is one of them. Plan on three plus months of active report writing, which is that section in that, that step in the middle, the report writing, not the pre-launch, not the scoping, not the review and sign off, the solid writing that it takes in the middle. I wanna also say again, from point of view of as regulatory writers, the CER, and we write many different documents um, across pharma, medical device and IVD, many of them very complex. I, I can say with confidence that in our opinion, the CER and the PER are the most complex report that we write. And it's not because there's a, a whole lot of data in it. It's, it's because it's a very, com although there is, it's a very complex story. And it's a very complex getting all the pieces together to culminate in a story and all the evidence that it's going to take for a successful submission and a notified body review. That's what we're hoping for. So uh, this, is a, this is a complex document. So you're gonna hear me talk a lot about uh, giving yourself a lot of time. Next slide. So let's start at this pre-launch phase. And for, from my point of view, uh, this is the most critical time for active regulatory affairs engagement because it sets the project up for success. This pre-launch phase can be months long because look at some of the tasks that we're gonna uh, talk about. Key tasks during this phase, perform a gap assessment. Where do you stand as an organization uh, to launch the clinical or performance evaluation of your device? Uh, where does, what is the critical review of your clinical data sources? Do you know where your clinical data, your clinical data is coming from? Do you believe that the data are sufficient to establish the safety and performance of your device as intended? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What is the status of those key CER input documents? For example, uh, the, the most critical document to the, the success of the CER and the and the one that will hold up things more than anything else, I bet you can guess which one I'm gonna say, it's the IFU. The IFU, if it's being revved, or there are decisions or discussions underway that would force a revision of the IFU, such as a design change, um, an intended use change, intended po population, anatomic location, anything. If any of those change the IFU, that's gonna be a major slowdown for the ability to write the CER. So from a regulatory standpoint, one of our key um, requests always is, is, is your IFU final? Is it expected to be revised? Do you expect any revisions? So that we can, even if you do expect them, um, when will they be done? And can you tell us what, what they involve so that we can, as we're writing the CER, we can put placeholders in, uh, it's almost like breadcrumbs in the CER. It's like, we need to go back and check this statement or this section, if it's going to be impacted by changes in the IFU. The IFU is by far the most 
critical document for the CER because it statements from it uh, populate virtually every section of the CER from beginning to end. So this is that is the the status of the IFU is probably the most important. But other key documents I want to, from a regulatory affairs standpoint, don't forget our friends out in the uh, design phase. Are, are designs, uh, design changes being contemplated for the device? And if so, are they going to be included in your clinical evaluation? Or are they going to wait until you're done with your clinical evaluation? So it's not just the IFU, it can be other things like downstream from the IFU that are going to trigger issues as well. Establish a clear regulatory strategy. What do, what do I mean by that? How, how are you going to approach, what is the approach going to be on the clinical evaluation report? What is the, what is the regulatory strategy? What is the route of conformity? What kind of early decision-making uh, do you need to make with regards to um, pre-planning, uh, your, your adequacy of your data, uh, you know, all kinds of things like that. And I, I kind of go on down here to say, identify critical resources. Is your uh, writing team prepped and trained? Do you have the ability to do systematic literature review as described in the MDR, which is by the way, not an internet search at all. This, it's a, the, I, I always say from a regular, again, regulatory affairs folks, help your writing teams be ready for this. And one of the biggest slowdowns for uh, when we talk to some of our clients is they have no ability to do a systematic literature review, or they think that an internet search or a PubMed search done on the internet is adequate for MDR. It is not. Uh, they will, the, the notified body will have things to say about uh, the, um, your literature, your presentation of your data identified from the literature. They, that needs to be a reproducible process from beginning to end. In other words, everything that you write in the CER, if they did it exactly the way you wrote it, um, and you, your search protocol from your description of your exclusion criteria, your choices for your screening, all of that. If they did all of that, would they come up with nearly the same results? And we, we proselytize about this a lot in some of our webinars is that, and, and an internet, starting with an internet search, that will be a, a difficult for the notified body to not comment on. Uh, so be thinking about those types of critical resources resources. I talk here about ensuring that the writing team is prepped and trained. Um, that is a, also a critical thing to uh, think through. Remember my comment a few minutes ago that the CER is the most, and we're experienced writers, the CER is the most challenging document that we write. It is, as I tend to say, it is not for the untrained or the faint of heart. Uh, it, is a, it is a difficult, complex document. It tells a story from beginning to end and the, and the through line through the CER is extremely important to maintain. And um, so that the notified body at the end of the day understands what it is you're telling them and they can find the data and the information easily and they can come to the same conclusions that, that the CER ha has come to. Uh, so th th this is why the writing team being prepped and trained, having a good CER template, ideally that is pressure tested already with the notified body. All these things are important considerations to take into um, account early on. And again, regulatory affairs can help lead this, these discussions. And establish, obviously, I don't need to tell regulatory affairs professionals to establish project timelines. You also don't need to tell writers to do that. We all crave timelines. What, how much time do we have? When, is, when, is, when are things due? Um, and how prepared are we? That's what pre-launch is all about. And there's my other tip. Do not underestimate the need for time. And often what I say when I put that tip up is that if you think it will take might take one month to do it, it will take two. If you think it will take, you have the resources to get it done in 
three months, it might take you six if you've never done it before. So uh, time is can be your friend, but it can often be your enemy. So don't let it be your enemy. Plan early, engage early, get your um, get your team, your cross-functional team prepped and ready to go and, and make sure you think you've got a path forward, regulatory strategy and so forth. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is the scoping and kickoff and the you know, at, at this phase, the writing team really have become the responsible stakeholders because they're responsible for writing it, whoever the writer is. But regulatory affairs can ensure that the scoping and kickoff of the project, that step is not skipped. It is very important that the scoping and kickoff especially brings all the team members together, the, the stakeholders together most especially the writing team, and so that the writing team can gather the information that they need as they begin to put pen to paper, as I say, and to begin to uh, build out the CER report shell and populate it, uh, populate it and get the systematic literature review started. So the key tasks during this phase, first of all, we've already talked about that, identify who the writing team is, who sits on the writing team, if it's multiple people, which I would recommend, one person is this is it's going to take them a long time to get the CER done. Um, so identify those responsible for writing the CER and the CEP. Sometimes in if you're doing that internally, it's different departments or different teams. And then identify critically for project X that Sally is the lead writer. Some there has to be a leader. Um, if there are multiple people that are going to contribute to the writing of the CER and the CEP. So identify that team. And again, review the CER input documents. The writing team should be familiar with the key document inputs. And then the question of, uh, are, does your organization have the ability to do systematic literature reviews? Um, and those capabilities, not an internet search. And we've we've done webinars on what that's what that looks like. If you're interested in what I mean by that, you can look back on other webinars about what are the systematic literature review requirements in MDR, and do you have the ability to do those? So the third here is identify scoping questions to review at the kickoff meeting. And the tip is relevant to this bullet point, which is to develop a scoping checklist to guide the process and document your key decisions and inputs. Um, I can remind you perhaps that in MedDev Rev 4, there is actually a, that's where it talks about scoping. It talks about these five phases. I didn't really make this up. Scoping is the pre-launch or scoping is phase zero in uh, MedDev Rev 4. So scoping cannot be overemphasized. Get yourself ready, answer those questions, get your team up and trained, get everybody on the same page. Um, make critical assessments about your the ability to get the CER written on deadline and on time. Where are your gaps? That's what we've been talking about so far. So these first two steps, the pre-launch and the scoping and, and the kickoff, are critical to set your report writing uh, up for, uh, gives it a better uh, a chance at success. So, and then don't forget, schedule a formal kickoff meeting. This is not, this should be, these uh, steps are, are meetings and people are talking about it, but at some point, gather the team together, develop a scoping checklist to guide that kickoff meeting, invite everybody, and make sure that everybody's on the same page about all, all issues, large and small, and with it, when it comes to the writing of the CER. So next slide. Now we're into the active report writing phase, and this is a long phase. Um, where regulatory affairs, you may think, okay, it's handed off to the writers now, job done, let's just wait for the baby to be born at the end. 
that's not the case at all. This is probably one of the most active phases for regulatory affairs support because things happen during this during this phase. So let's look at some of these things that happen. Key tasks during this phase for regulatory affairs to help out the riders. Help to ensure the timely deliverable delivery of critical inputs from the cross-functional departments. Often the riders are or whoever is doing the writing doesn't have a lot of visibility with the other cross-functional teams. So regulatory affairs, as, as we all know, really sits in the catbird seat. It, it oversees everything or it touches everything. You, though, you of those in regulatory affairs, you're talking to quality, you're talking to clinical, you're talking to R&D, you're talking to so many departments you're, you're unique in that way. And writers sometimes are more, um, uh, you know, off in our own world, getting the job done. So regulatory affairs can be a, a real um, asset to the project when there are slowdowns. What kind of slowdowns might happen during the report writing phase? These the delivery of these critical inputs from cross-functional departments. That would be something like, well, we're waiting for somebody in risk management to get us those reports, or we don't have the PMS data yet, it's not coming until we don't know when. These are all slowdowns to a writer and they threaten the timelines of the writing projects. So regulatory affairs step in, help us out and help get things moving. Handle roadblocks, much the same thing. Stalled decision-making, that happens to us a lot. We've, our team writes something to Mary who has that particular information asking for clarification and we don't hear back from Mary. And a week goes by and we still haven't heard back from Mary and we send her another email. Regulatory affairs, you can really help out the writer uh, by um, unsticking and unblocking those decision making. So unresponsiveness or stalled or delayed documents, these, this happens all the time in every project we've ever done. So regulatory affairs sits um, at, in a great position to be able to help and serve as that key resource to the writing team just in, in case that we can't get the answers ourselves, maybe you can find the answers for us or and ensuring that the writing team is getting what they need. You're, you're kind of our um, champion sometimes. If it's a writing team, then folks are sometimes take their eye off of the project because they're busy doing other things and then the project might start to stall. And then what right, regulatory affairs and what we all love more than anything else, support the project cadence and enforce timelines. Um, you, regulatory affairs folks, you will find that writers live and die by timelines just like you do. And um, we, we love enforcement of timelines. So if there's ever any issues, um, we are not your enemy, we're your friend. Let's, let's get the timelines going here. We've got to understand what we're doing and how long we have to do it. So this at, during this active report writing uh, phase, just in general, this is a great time. Don't go away, don't, don't leave the writing team. This is probably when they need you the most. Next slide. Okay, the finish line is in sight. And this is where we really want to get this pushed across the finish line. And you can really help make an impact at this final writing stage. What happens during this final writing stage? The review and sign off. This is a review. Let's just talk about that. This is where typically the, a full blown CER will go into usually two full rounds of review by the cross functional team. Sometimes it's a cross functional team for one of the reviews. And, and the other review, the first review is, is done by maybe the project lead within regulatory affairs or within the company clinical, but it's, it's the review process. This is usually a week to review and a week to let the writer fix whatever the review found, address the review comments. And then it usually goes back for a second round, more review, more review comments, a week goes by, especially when it's cross-functional, and then more um, uh, more um, updates by the writing team. That's four weeks. That's a month. So plan for a month, and um, 
So what are the key phases during this phase? So plan it in advance. You know it's coming. Plan. Help the cross-functional team with prepping them for what they're responsible to do. What does a CER review mean from their point of view? Um, if they're busy or they're going to be out, either replace them with somebody else when you know the review is going to happen or block their calendars if necessary to ensure the reviews are completed on time. We have seen all of those tactics and more done. And um, I want to direct your eye to our, our tip. And this phase is often marked by unnecessary delays due to the, I hate to point a finger at them, but due to the unavailability of cross-functional and especially if you have external medical reviewers. They can either be very on time and very on it, or they can go dark. And we're all sitting around waiting for the medical reviewer to uh, give their key input and in which then can change a lot of things so that the external medical reviewers can really help to wrangle them and keep them on task as well to align with the timelines. And as I say here on the slide, continue to handle your roadblocks, the stalled decision-making, unresponsiveness and delayed. It's the same actually uh, all along. And then enforcing that submission timeline. Last. Not much to say here because you're at the end. The writing is done, the report reviewed, signed off, and in the hands of the regulatory team. Congratulations, everybody. This is where I don't have a lot to say because I'm not a regulatory affairs professional, but I know all these doc documents are getting gathered. They're getting prepped. There's signatures that, because we signed them, signatures that need to be um, gathered, filing, document control processes, and finally submission and to take a breath. Um, that is all of my, uh, my presentation for today, I am looking forward to, let's see, we can go to the last slide, which is just a big thank you. And that it's time for questions and discussion. So thanks for your attention. Let's, let's uh, see what the, some of the questions are. All right, thanks, Lori. We have reviewed your questions that you have submitted um, when you registered for this webinar. We've selected many of them to answer, but if you have questions now after watching, please send them in using the Q&A button and we will get to them in the order that we receive them. And now let's get to our first question. Can you see the question on your screen, Lori? I can. All right. So um, Stephen is asking, from an RA perspective, what do you feel is the most important step you can take to prepare for a CE submission under the MDR? I, I did see this question a little bit in advance, but just before we signed on, and I, I thought, I said, oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will say that it's hard to pick what is the most single most important step you can take to prepare. If, if I were to choose one, it's the regulatory strategy because out of that flows supporting the decision on what your regulatory strategy is, our key answers to key questions says, what is our data sufficiency? <clears throat> what does our IFU look like? What are our claims? What are the clinical benefits that are being, um, that are being, uh, uh, will be identified? And what are the claims that are being made, clinical claims that are being made that require clinical data to back them up? What is our safety and, what are our safety and performance objectives? All of these questions have to go into ultimately what is the regulatory strategy, the, the route of conformity, if you will. Remember, we, we have a lot of, we get a lot of questions about well-established technology. Um, so the writer is gonna need to know whether we need to deploy the MDCG 2020-6, which relates to uh, well-established technology, or does article 6110 come into play because there are issues perhaps with your clinical data and claims and patients benefits. 
So the regulatory strategy route of conformity um, decision must take into account uh, data sufficiency, um, equivalence questions, all of that. So I would say that's the most important and most careful decision to make. All right, let's get to our next question. This question comes from Ash. How can we build a schedule for RACER inputs that adequately prioritizes and orders inputs that drive CER? Well, first of all, Ash, I think you said, um, bravo for the question, for even thinking about it, because we talked to many clients who, who either don't think about it or haven't thought it through completely. And that's really from that practical standpoint, that's why we put this webinar on today because it's a, because it's just a practical guideline. It's not, you, you notice that I didn't, you know, it, I just talked, talked about practicalities. These are the things you need to think about. These are the order in which you need to think about them. And this is why they're important. So this is a great question. How can you build a schedule? I would say, look at the, look at this webinar, start with those pre-planning, go through the steps of perhaps make a list or a uh, like a spreadsheet of the key inputs that we've talked about and the key decisions. So inputs are one thing, those are documents. Sometimes inputs can't be finalized until decisions are made before that, such as the IFU, such as a potential design change or change in intended use. Clearly those are decisions precede the change to the IFU and other documents. De design changes are a big trap sometimes because maybe clinical and regulatory affairs isn't really fully clued into that a design change is coming or when it can come. So I would, I would just say that use the timeline that I gave you build out a schedule of the, what are the key inputs? Who is responsible for those key inputs? Which are the most important ones? Um, and ones that can wait. So remember, if we're writing the CER over three or three or so months, here are some things that happen right at the beginning, if we're gonna prioritize. One of the first thing that needs to happen out of when you start the CER project is the literature reviews need to happen. And there are, just to remind everyone, there are three literature reviews, systematic literature reviews that go in support of a CER. That is the state of the art literature review. And all three of these need to be screened and reviewed. So that's a big process there and data extracted. The state of the art, the competitor device, and ultimately the subject device. So for the state of the art section, the subject device, sorry, the competitor device and the state of the art literature reviews, two of those reviews need to be done just to write the state of the art section. And the state of the art section sets up the rest of the CER. So if we're talking about planning and prioritizing, keep your eyes on the ball for the state of the art. What needs to go into that? Who are your competitors? What are your safety and performance objectives that you're going to choose? Because that directly relate directly relates to those two um, to those two searches, which have to be done in order to even write the state of the art. So I would say that's an example of the prioritization as you move through the scheduling that you can do. First and foremost, state of the art. What needs to be done in order to get the state of the art rolling? And then what are the other key inputs that could derail along the line? So that's about the prioritizing and ordering of the inputs. Know your, know your, your inputs, know what's needed, and know what section of the CER they impact. All sections, for example, the IFU, or just one particular section. For example, reg, uh, risk. Let's, take, let's talk about risk. For our, for our um, the way we write a CER, risk is the next to the last section. Everything comes together in the risk section, risk and benefit section, everything. And I always say, and I've said this in many, others, in many other webinars, that's where the 
the conclusion comes to land where everything comes together in the risk benefit section and the notified body, the entire thing is laid out essentially there. It comes at the end. So if you were prioritizing risk documentation, that isn't necessarily an early prioritization. Does it need to be done relatively soon? Yes. Are you worried about it if it if it might drag on, it will definitely, if it drags on and you've reached the end of your CER writing and you're waiting for your risk benefit assessments and matrix reports, everything that your internal team is doing, you, that, that's a hard stop. We can't do anything to finish the CER without that documentation, but it doesn't come early. It comes, let's just say mid process, it should be done. So I hope that helped to kind of schedule and prioritize what comes first, what comes in the middle, what comes last, what's important to pay attention to the entire time. Next question. All right. Our next question comes from Karen. She's asking, at what point in the development process do you start the clinical evaluation planning? Another excellent question. Thank you, Karen. So I, will, I would point out that the question says, at what point in the development process do you start the clinical evaluation planning? Early. Um, why? Because you want that, and I, what I assume we're talking about for development is the development of the device or the, or the, the early decisions when it comes to what does this device do who does it do it to and in what clinical conditions, in what anatomic locations, and what is it intended to do? All of those purpose statements that happen early on, that's when you should be thinking, you should always be thinking about your clinical evaluation because all of those early, early decisions will come home to roost in the report of your clinical evaluation process, which is a CER. So, Keep in mind when you're making these early decisions, will you have the, can you, de, can you um, develop the data, the clinical data for it? Not just the technical data, but how are you going to get your clinical data for that intended use that you're contemplating? What claims are you, are you prepared to write down and do you have the clinical data for them if those claims um, lead to a clinical benefit, a patient benefit, a clinical patient benefit. So this is again, getting back into some of these, you know, like article 6110 was really what I was referencing right there. So these early decisions, if you map out the strategy of a CER, what needs to be in a CER and how you need to present it and what justifications can you provide, that's early. All of that is early. So if you're going to deviate from something where the justification may be, not deviate so much, but maybe not have a straightforward path, start writing your justifications for that early, right at the beginning. Why are you, um, what is the justification for uh, taking an equivalence route? For example, um, do you really have that predicate device? Um, is it really equivalent? And for all indications, anatomic locations, everything, you know, vasculature, all of that. So those are the kind of questions you need to be asking early and cover your bases or have a plan to cover your bases. And that's in the development process when those early decisions are being made. All right, great. Thanks, Lori. Here's our next question coming from Kelly. At what point should we be considering or performing device equivalence evaluation for a new device when the CEP is published? So at what, so, okay. So let's talk about the CEP, a plan in general, a plan. A, a, a plan should be a, a plan should be the plan and it should be the forerunner of the report. Um, your, your plan, as, as we know from just from the word plan, it's a plan. What do you intend to do? What do you intend to collect? How do you intend to present? What is the intended strategy? There's, there's that we've just been talking about. 
all of this intention. Um, and does the CER need to follow that plan in lockstep? Absolutely. Will the notified body pull your plan and look at it in this and look at the CER to make sure you're making the same statements in both documents and that they align? Absolutely. So, um, and they will they will do that. So the linkage of those two documents, I can't overemphasize enough. So when is the CEP published? In our experience, published is it, by the way, published to me is a different word than developed. The CEP should be developed early because it will inform the CER. But oftentimes a strategy for many of our clients is that there's already a working CEP when we begin the CER, but the CER will sometimes flesh out necessary tweaks, if you will, to the CEP so that they both align. So it's not uncommon for uh, us to finish the CEP after we finish the CER. Now that's that's not published, that's, that's just the project timelines, how we're all going about it. The, the CER and the CEP can sometimes be developed somewhat in tandem, or I should say written, I should say written. The CEP should be well developed beforehand, but finalized, it can be often be finalized when we're actually writing the CER because there will be tweaks. And if you make a tweak in one place, you have to make it in both if it applies. So there's that question about the CER being published. Equivalence, I'm, I'm betting that you can guess what I'm gonna say early because that's part of that strategy. And I've already referenced when is the equivalence evaluation uh, for a new device, for a new device. So, I, I just read that a new device, it will either have a predicate device that the, that the company owns or by some miracle has the ability to access the tech file of a, another predicate device, perhaps owned by another company. And there are changing rules. I'm hearing kind of changing rules about that a little bit, or at least an expansion of that. A uh, whole thing about you must have a contract in place in order to access the tech file of a competitor device, for example, that could be considered the predicate device. But that aside, if it's a new device, if it's a brand new device and it has no predicate that you own, you, ha you have to develop your own clinical data. It, it will have no data. So this is a clinical investigation of, of some, sort of a, some sort of a gathering of clinical data. Um, if it's a brand new device, if it is a brand new device, that's a derivation of a predicate device. Now we're talking about that you own. Now we're talking about equivalence. And that is a, that section of the CER is sometimes the longest section. The longest section of the CER should always be the state of the art, but because it's the most dense with information, but the next longest section is usually the, um, the equivalent section. Uh, because point by point by point, clinical, technical, biological characteristics, every single one have to be stacked up. So you as a team need to do that exercise. It should not wait for the writers to come on to do that exercise. You should have already been doing that because it feeds into your strategy of, can you even go forward with an equivalence argument? And we've had many conversations with with potential clients um, about equivalence. And some of those conversations, they have an unclear uh, expectation or unclear understanding of equivalence and thus unrealistic expectations about equivalence. It's very exacting. So those are, so you should be doing it early and you should be doing that exercise early. And if there is any element of the clinical, technical or biological details of the device that is not the same, in other words, similar, you should be starting to write justifications for why there is no clinical impact to the patient because the guide wire has a marking device on one that's blue, but on the other one is yellow. That's a, that's a, that's a difference. 
that's called a sim it's similar and you must write a justification for that. All right, let's get to our next question here. This person is asking, in what cases can RA be replaced by a clinical evaluation team being part of product design? What would you say about this question? I, I would say that's completely, you know, I think that's a great question because it, it take, make your organization stru organizational structure any way that works for you is my answer. As long as you are getting the job done, have clear, um, everyone has a clear roles and expectations and there are clear decision makers, whether it's a clinical evaluation team um, or regulatory affairs or whomever. In our experience with our clients, usually clinical uh, for mid to large size companies, maybe not small because everybody wears many hats in small companies, but in mid to large size company, usually the clinical folks oversee the clinical evaluation report. They oversee this, the CDP, the plans, all of the, they oversee all of that bucket. But that, and sometimes they do have a clinical evaluation team that then assign, if they have many, many products, they will have their, their scientists or members of their clinical evaluation team be, have assigned 10 of their products. And if we're working on one of those products, that will be our point, that person would be our point person, for example. So however you structure it, it to work for you, is is good. I believe that clinical, if you have that ability, because this is a clinical evaluation report, should have solid eyes on the CER, whether it's led by a clinical person or led by a regulatory person um, is, uh, is really up to the individual organization and its team structure. Okay. Here's our next question. This attendee is asking, what level of involvement should regulatory have in the literature review process, specifically to support their submissions? So specifically to support their submission. So I'm going to I'm going to go with that in this case because this is about clinical evaluation and performance evaluation reports. I'm going to be I'm going to couch that as a submission to the EU for CE mark or continuing CE mark rather than FDA. So let's, I'll get that one straight, specifically to support their submissions to the EU under MDR. What level of involvement should regulatory have in the literature review process? All right. Now, my answer there is I don't think regulatory affairs people should be doing the actual screening. Um, that's a very clinically driven and it's, and it has 100% to do with the safety and performance objectives that you've chosen for your device. Screening of competitor device literature uh, searches for acceptance criteria and screening of subject device literature searches for clinical data on the subject device under evaluation. Ultimately, that should be a clinical um, endeavor because it has everything to do with the safety and performance objectives. So I wouldn't say that regulatory affairs should be actually doing the screening and review, but they should ensure that the right people are because that is a critical component of the clinical evaluation or performance evaluation process. Again, I say, and I may have already said it in this webinar, if the notified body questions your data, and by questioning the data, I mean, how did you identify it? How did you screen it? Why did you choose this article and not that article? Why did you put forward this data and not that data? If they question that, that process and methodology, they question all the data. And if they are questioning the data, you know, your arguments are becoming invalid or ir irrelevant, essentially. Your, your conclusions are becoming irrelevant because they question the data. 
And they don't, might not question the, the way you handled the data, they're questioning the way you identified the data and chose it. So again, that, that's a very clinically driven, methodologically robust process. All right, let's get to our next question here. Um, Brian is asking, where do you place the plans, clinical and PMs in the project success pathway? So Brian, first of all, I love the project success pathway terminology. I think that sounds very positive. Good for you and your team. Um, I think I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. We talked about the plan and all plans. So uh, specifically, I talked about the CEP, the clinical evaluation plan. Um, all plans, because they're planning documents, should come early in the project success pathway. Knowing that there, as you undergo the evaluation part of that pathway, that the plans may need to be tweaked. But high level decisions, concrete pathway, you know, concrete decisions and planning need to be part of the plan. And that needs to be laid out from the beginning because it's it provides a roadmap for moving forward. So I say early, but with the caveat that don't forget they may need to be tweaked as you undergo the active and iterative process of the evaluation. And that's culminating in the writing of the CER the evaluation of the data, the evaluation of everything. You have to remember that at the end of the day, when you engage with the CER, that's really usually the first time that you're doing systematic literature reviews on your competitor data. You don't might not know what the acceptance criteria are that are gonna be pulled uh, from the uh, competitor data to establish the safety and performance measures or the bar by which your safety and performance measures or must be um, judged, your own subject device data, you may run into issues once you begin this clinical evaluation report process. So be nimble is my suggestion. Okay, we have about five minutes left. So we'll probably get to a couple more questions. Here is the next one from Angela. How is it possible to apply the RA requirements in a small company? Oh, Angela, I, we talk to a, a lot of small companies that have that sort of existential question. How, how can we possibly do this? We're a small company. We, we, we wear many different hats. I, I feel you. I, I, I do. How is it possible? You, you either manage to do it yourself and wear those many hats or you appeal to your senior management for budgets to get outside help. That's how, in, in my mind, and this is not a plug for Criterion Edge or anybody else, it, bandwidth is bandwidth. Expertise is expertise. If you have it, you don't have it, that's fine, but be realistic. You've got to do a realistic assessment of your gaps. Remember I said to prepare for this, do a gap assessment. And that was on that first slide. What are your require, what is required and do we have that? Can we do systematic literature reviews that the MDR requires? Do we have the ability for, uh, do we have good CER templates? Has anyone here ever written a CER, for example? These are all important questions to ask. And to plan for as far as you can go, either acquire more help through you know, engaging with a, a vendor, hiring more people, getting consultants, whatever it is, that's how you do it because you can't manufacture expertise in a small company with a small staff. You can't suddenly become an expert on the clinical evaluation process, which is highly complex um, without if, if never, you've never done it before. And I don't think I need to remind this audience is what's at stake if it's done wrong or poorly. I, I mean, you can draw your own conclusions there. So um, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Okay. So 
So Kushbu is asking, can we really let go of literature appraisals if clinical performance data is available? Can scientific validity be justified? What would you say about this, Lori? To the first question, can we really not do literature appraisals? I imagine that's what is meant by let go of them by, in other words, not perform appraisal of literature if clinical performance data is available. Let me be very clear. All clinical data sets in a CER must be weighted and appraised using validated tools that are available to everybody. OCEBM, all, all different kinds. Usually we follow the um, guidelines. So all data sets, that means, what does that mean? Your PMS data set, your clinical investigations, if you have those data, those data sets. Literature, and you must perform a literature review on your subject device, that must be done. Even if the results, you already know the results are going to be zero, you must per perform it. And you must screen every single and Wait, uh, you must screen and select, uh, include or exclude, every single um, article that comes back on that uh, 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 subject device literature search, even if you get to that it, it, it revealed, the search revealed 100 articles, all 100 were excluded for these various reasons, which you must document. If any are included, that's a data set. If 20 are included, that's 20 data sets with 20 different weighting and appraisals. So that is the methodology that's required. And can science, I'm sorry for the, for the person that submitted this. I, I don't think I fully understand the intent of the second part of the question. Can scientific validity be justified? So I'm gonna skip that one. I'm not really sure what's meant by that. So. Maybe we can, and it looks like we're at the end of our time anyway. Um, so apologies, if you want to engage with me more to, uh, on your questions about this, I'm happy to chat with you on the phone. Okay, thanks, Lori. We are out of time. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, thank you everyone again for attending and for all your great questions today. Take care and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Have a great day.